All right. Welcome to our Confidence in Conflict podcast. I'm Lisa Terry, your host, and I am joined by four of my very esteemed colleagues today, Tony York, Robert Whiteside, Tom Smith, and Jill Weissensel. Today, we're going to discuss a subject that has long been important to many of us, uh, going beyond the use of force in healthcare. And it should be a reasonable uh, and appropriate discussion. And I want to thank everyone for joining us today. And before we get started, I wanted to uh, share on behalf of this amazing panel and their dedication to our industry and to the International Association of uh, Healthcare Security and Safety, I am making a donation to the IAHSS Foundation. Uh, because of the foundation's valuable research that I've used many times over the years, the education, the scholarships, recognition of our security heroes, um, and much more, I want to encourage all of you to consider doing the same. So to get us started, I would like to ask our panel members to tell us a bit about who they are and their career journey. So Tony, if you'll start us off. Well, thanks, Lisa, and thanks for the generous donation and the time to spend with these wonderful folks. Uh, I, you know, you talk about IHSS and I feel like it's so instrumental to the journey I've been on. Um, you know, a lot of people that know me know that I was hired uh, into this space uh, many years ago by a gentleman that uh, was our first president of the International Association of Hospital Security, a gentleman by the name of Russ Colling, who has long been a mentor to me and so many others and the, a very influential voice. And uh, he also sort of helped me understand how important it was to give back and to really continuously raise that bar of professionalism. So my journey has been that of a healthcare security professional um, from right after my university studies to doing internships with North Carolina Baptist Hospital, which is part of Lake Forest and Atrium now. But, uh, you know, I moved to Colorado and joined a firm that was owned by the hospitals here uh, that specialized with a shared service approach that was uh, where we were able to see security delivered in just a volume of different entities from level one trauma centers all the way to hospitals that were single, had single rooms that were for emergencies and so many things in between. And it gave me a, just a, a one, a passionate pursuit to say, how do we continue to really create a safeness in these environments? But more important as anything is how do we educate others on this important role that uh, is the essential nature of a healthcare security professional, the officers, the leaders, and everyone in between that is really contributing to quality patient outcomes. That journey's driven me for all the give back I've done, the writings that I like to do, and uh, being a part of such a, a, an important industry. It's, a, it's the most fulfilling job I think I could have ever taken on, and uh, it's something that still gives back every day. Thanks, Lisa. Awesome. Thank you, Tony. Um, I'll move over. Robert. Hello. Um, I'm humbled to be in the presence of all of you because I have learned so much from everybody on this panel. So, um, yeah, my, my journey uh, really started, you know, a long time ago uh, with college, getting a degree in anthropology, which early on gave me an appreciation for people. And it's kind of carried me through a career in law enforcement. And then I um, started at a small county owned hospital in Hendersonville, North Carolina. And then from there, I hopped over to uh, Mission Health in Asheville and I spent almost a decade there. Um, and then in 2019, I came to Duke. I did also have a small uh, uh, foray out to the West Coast and I worked at uh, Oregon State Hospital, the hospital where they filmed One Flew Over a Cuckoo's Nest. So I got a good um, introduction to state psychiatric hospital, you know, issues, whether it's operational issues or budget issues. Uh, but I'm, I'm at Duke now and then finally beginning to throw my arms around the entire system um, since, you know, leader, leadership here is, is in a state of, you know, transition. Um, I brought several colleagues from uh, Western North Carolina out here with me. And I'm happy to be here at Duke, um, continuing to transform this program into uh, what we want to be the best in the world. And, uh, and that's, that's kind of me in a nutshell. Awesome. Thank you, Robert. So, Tom. Thanks, Lisa. Um, I appreciate being able to join this group. Uh, it's a, uh, an interesting uh, set of topics, first, to say the least. Uh, but 
I'm probably old, uh, the oldest of the bunch here, uh, for sure. I've been in healthcare since 1981, managing healthcare security programs, including a, a community hospital uh, in Saginaw, Michigan, a, a good size inner city medical center in Flint, Michigan, and then on to uh, University of North Carolina Healthcare System here in Chapel Hill. And uh, for the last 20 years or so, I've been working uh, with uh, healthcare security consultants um, and uh, purchased the company in uh, 2013 and have been working full time as a, a consultant doing uh, security assessments for healthcare facilities, operational assessments, um, leadership coaching, and expert witness services. So um, I've served on several leadership positions with the IHSS, of which uh, I think the, uh, the flagship would include. Uh, serving on the Healthcare Security Industry Guidelines Council since its inception. And uh, I reluctantly uh, left that group last year, but uh, still heavily steeped in watching those guys so they don't, uh, so they don't go astray. Um, so you're gonna hear a lot uh, in, this, in this portion of my segments about what are the industry guidelines, because in my mind, that's what, um, that's a standard that, uh, it's a guideline, but uh, it's something that all security programs should uh, should strive to meet. Excellent, excellent. So, Jill, finally, <laughs> thank you, Lisa. I uh, really appreciate the invite to be here, and, and like Robert said, and like Tom said, uh, humbled to be here. I've learned so much from everybody on this panel, and really welcome the opportunity to be here. Uh, so I bring to the table, you know, 20 years experience working in hospital security, uh, in healthcare security, and in law enforcement, spending most of my career uh, with the Marquette University Police Department uh, in Milwaukee, mostly night shift patrol. Uh, but there, you know, I had the opportunity to serve as a patrol commander and was responsible for our professional communication skills training, our defensive tactics training, and our active shooter preparedness and response. Uh, Natural transition for me over to the Vistalar training team, where our sole mission is creating emotionally and physically safe uh, environments. Uh, so it's really been uh, it's been an honor. It's been a journey. Uh, humbled to be here and and happy to weigh in where I can. So thank you. Excellent. Wow. Um, I'm definitely in the presence of of greatness, and I'm so very uh, appreciative of you folks being here. So I guess. To start off, if you don't mind, Tony, for the context of this discussion, um, would you just be so kind as to identify and define use of force in the healthcare environment so that, and also for us, but share where you obtain that definition? Yeah, certainly, Lisa. And, and, and Tom sort of uh, set this perfect stage for me, right? You know, we talked about the IHSS Healthcare Security Industry Guidelines, and one of the very earliest guidelines was the security officer use of force. And um, I'm, I'm dating all the way back, I think, to 2007, when the, uh, the, the council at the time really tackled the issue. But the concept was the amount of physical effort that is used to compel cooperation and compliance. That is really beyond a guiding touch. And so when you think about that and you break that down, it's not just being hands on or putting somebody in handcuffs or something like that. Right. It is the presence of the individual that is really saying, now I'm really helping someone get cooperation, but they're using the physical touch of the individual to do that. And, you know, it's really interesting how all of us in this space, probably if we're sitting on an airplane at some point in time, tell somebody, what do we do for a living? Yeah, what it means and how often that physical touch has to be utilized, right? The healthcare security industry is not an observe and report only industry. And if I could share with anyone that's watching with us right now is we have to understand, yes, we never want to do that until it's a means of last resort. But there are times um, where it does require that of the healthcare security officer. But the IHSS has been uh, very consistent. We review that guideline uh, every three years, Lisa. And as a result of that, um, a few years ago, uh, that guideline now and that particular definition found itself into something the IHSS participated in, and that was creating a new industry glossary of terms. And that's where that particular definition can be found on the IHSS website. Excellent. Excellent. So 
OSHA has taken a much stronger stance in recent years requiring that healthcare facilities must have some sort of workplace violence programs to protect staff, and they have been leveraging hefty fines against those who do not have those programs. And of course, in January of 2022, many of us know that Joint Commission actually issued some new and revised requirements to uh, for healthcare organizations specific to their workplace violence programs and prevention efforts. Uh, then last year in November, the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services uh, issued a memo regarding workplace violence in hospitals, and they emphasized that they will enforce the regulatory expectations that patients and staff have a safe environment in which care is delivered. Now, it should be noted uh, that security is charged most of the time in protecting staff, patients, and visitors. However, CMS places significant restrictions at times on those security officers when he or she may be protecting a staff member from a patient or protecting a patient from another patient. And I've heard some individuals say that it's as if these two uh, federal agencies conflict at times. So, Tom, I'll kind of bring this question back to you. Um, if a security officer is requested to assist with the restraint of a patient and physical force is necessary to obtain control of that situation, what are the legal and ethical parameters that should be met? Well, I didn't get the easy question first here, I guess. Um, but uh, you know, it's important to note that the specific legal and ethical guidelines can vary depending on the jurisdiction um, and local laws. So it's, it's really essential to consult your legal and regulatory advisors as you consider this question for your facilities. So I, I'm going to talk in, in some generalities here and, and speak to some resources that uh, I think are out there. But um, there are several legal and ethical parameters that should be met to help address safety and well-being of everybody involved in the healthcare environment. But uh, I personally consider healthcare security officers as part of the healthcare workforce. And as such, they're usually just like any other hospital employee that's been asked to assist in a patient restraint. So, um, and I say usually, there, there are some exceptions based on hospitals' policies, uh, local jurisdictions. But um, I think they're just like any other employee. If a, a restraint has been deemed to be necessary by one of the providers, um, a qualified, somebody that's qualified to order a restraint or seclusion, then um, security is just like any other hospital employee helping out with that. Um, the officers have to follow their policies, procedures, and training that have been provided. And we'll talk a little bit about policies and procedures a little bit later and the importance of making sure they align. But uh, here's some, some general pr principles to consider. Um, many uh, law enforcement security and security agencies in healthcare use uh, what's called the use of force continuum. I'm sure that's not unfamiliar to a lot of people, but it outlines uh, levels of force that can be used in escalating situations. Um, I like to use, I like to see the use of force um, include patient restraint. These, these use of force continuums should include what level of force is included in patient restraint. So that way, officers aren't receiving some specialized training for non-patient situations that includes use of force or patient situations that may include use of force. So I think as much as we can tie those two together, we can end up with less confusion for the officers being trained. I think it's important to maintain proportionality. A uh, level of force should be used that must be proportionate to the threat uh, or the, the situation presented by the patient. As we all know, unnecessary excessive force can lead to legal liabilities. Everyone has a video camera these days, and in, and in most cases, the, whatever has happened is, is uh, captured by the camera systems uh, in the healthcare environment. Um, Use of force can be legally justified if necessary to protect yourself or others from harm. Um, again, training and policy compliance. Uh, security officers and hospital police should have proper training in the appropriate use of force techniques. And I know we're going to talk about that a little bit later, so I'm not going to touch on it. And then, you know, some of the ethical uh, parameters, um, you know, use of force should be designed to minimize harm and, and injuries to patients and others involved. Unreasonable or reckless actions can lead to legal consequences, of course. And we'll talk just briefly about that at the end here. But uh, we want to respect for dignity individuals. You know, if we talk ethics, um, we have to respect people and, and the, maintain dignity. Um, use of force should not involve degrading or humiliating actions. Um, 
avoiding unnecessary harm, uh, and tra maintain transparency and accountability, transparency and accountability, because um, in my practice, many times I'll find there's been a use of force and there's no documentation. There's no no sense of a report or anything of that nature. So I think it, it, every in every occasion where force is used, uh, a report is required or some documentation, you may call it something else, but it needs to be required. And uh, de-escalation, again, uh, ethically, we have to de-escalate first. Um, communication is important with the, with the staff that are ordering the restraint. And uh, there has to be a two-way communication where possible. Sometimes I know it may not be possible. You're called up to assist with something. There's just an all out, um, uh, very difficult situation presenting it. So there may not be time to figure out what happened beforehand when you're presented with a situation when you arrive on a unit. Um, I think during training, cultural sensitivity is also important to uh, making sure that uh, officers realize and understand some of the situations that may present them that they may be presented with that have some cultural differences and, and or individuals with mental health conditions have special needs as well. Medical considerations that doesn't, you know, almost don't have to say it, we're in a hospital, but uh, in the healthcare setting, physical and mental well-being of the patient should always be the priority. I'm involved in some situations where security, officer, security officers are asked to do a restraint and they were never told, oh, by the way, mm -hmm. this medical condition might might have something to do with the restrainer. You, you have to be careful their arm and careful their leg. Um, and they go to the restraint. And then after the fact, they find out, gosh, we probably shouldn't have, uh, you know, touched that area or been more mindful of uh, protecting that area. So training is critical. Um, and I'll talk about that toward the end here at the end about training where let's make sure that, that it's done as a continuum, um, making sure that if we're training on, police tactics and law enforcement tactics that uh, there's some, if you do that, that there's some linkage with whatever the patient restraint techniques are to be used. So that's where I think building it into the use of force continuum is important. So that's the long story short. There's a lot of references that uh, that we can talk to um, and uh, I'll speak to that at the end. So just a couple of quick follow-ups to that, Tom. Um, would you say that the, 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 the optimal response would be security and the clinical care team together? Or, I mean, there's many times that officers get called and then staff, clinical staff may step, step away. Yeah, there's uh, uh, absolutely. Um, most hospitals have lots of different staff with different uh, uh, capabilities and uh, I think a behavioral health response teams are very popular and I advocate every single assessment I've almost ever done in the last 10 years says if if hospitals don't have one or the organization doesn't have a behavioral health response team um, that's the way to do it it should be a multidisciplinary approach to restraint and seclusion uh, and de-escalation and uh, and that requires lots of training and togetherness and who's going to be on the team. Again, there's a, there's another a wonderful guideline that's just been released this year on um, implementing uh, behavioral health response teams or BERT teams. So I would refer those looking at this to, you know, look that one up. And if you don't have one, or even if you have one of the teams, look at the elements that are in that guideline and uh, let's, let's make sure that your team includes and incorporates uh, the guideline uh, items that have been pointed out. And Lisa, if you, if you think yes, about what Tom just said, it really is old school when you really think about the security officer should be basically hand in the back, door pulled, and being expected to just manage that patient uh, disruptive situation in isolation, right? And, and, and if you think about it, I think it speaks to how we as security professionals have to educate the clinical care uh, teams themselves about how to best use those services, how to establish the expectations that really govern the relationship between the two. And, and there's so many of the clinical care professionals I have come across over the years that they don't understand that the actual authority being bestowed upon the officer is actually provided by them. It, <clears throat> it's their license. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> So I'm going to move over to Robert. I have a couple <laughs> questions for you, Robert. And one of them kind of is, 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 is reference to the question that I just asked Tom. 
mm-hmm. does does this does the um, I guess the the legal and ethical parameters change if this is a hospital police officer that responds to assist with that restraint of a patient? Yeah, and thank you, uh, uh, Tom and Tony, for those comments because you 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 laid the foundation for what um, what I was going to speak to here. Well, I, let me let me give my perspective through the lens of um, where I come from, and particularly through a Duke lens, how we do things here. Uh, I'll say first that we strive here to keep police out of patient interventions, uh, and that is to avoid uh, uh, various issues having to do with um, violating someone's rights. People people perhaps perceiving that they're under custody or in custody of a police officer. Um, but let's say a few years back when, when this stance was less, uh, a cultural issue here, well, by that, I mean, where police did get a little bit more involved. Um, when we engage with a patient, whether it's security or police, then, uh, we engage as part of the care team. And again, Tom and Tony have already alluded to this. We get our authority, whether it's a police officer or whether it's a security officer, sworn or non-sworn, we get our authority to act as in that care team from the licensed practitioner, a doctor, a nurse, et cetera. And, and we take our directions from them. Uh, and that's, and, and again, um, Tom and Tony, I've already alluded to this. That's the key difference uh, between a patient and a non-patient intervention is that with a patient intervention, it's led by a medical team member. And we participate as a part of the care team in a, in a collaborative manner. Uh, and we have a full, fully active BERT team here in our Duke facilities. And so when we respond, we respond as security, a psychiatric clinician, a health supervisor, a nurse, at least those people. And, um, and there may be more than one security because sometimes, as we know, it takes, uh, you know, a certain amount of muscle to, 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 to physically you know, kind of, uh, and therapeutically manage, a, um, a violent patient, but nonetheless, it's the medical team member who leads it. And like Tony said, there's a lot of times it's more so the medical professional who's less than informed about that point than it is our own team. And so we have to maybe even in the moment professionally remind them that, that, you know, uh, what would you like us to do? We're here to keep everybody safe. Um, we actively work not to be left alone with patients. And again, that's, that's kind of a reinforcement of the team approach. And um, in my, in my um, experience, we have to kind of constantly educate our medical team on this, on this point. Less so our team, because we educate people on our team from, from the date of hire moving forward. Now, when we engage with a non-patient, while CMS does have some language related to uh, the use of weapons on a patient visitor or uh, uh, even staff, um, the regulatory guidelines uh, stipulate that it's, that it's expected to be handled as a law enforcement matter and law enforcement is involved. And that, and that always occurs when, like, say, like last night when we had a drunk visitor in the parking lot, that's a security led operation. You know, we, we don't even, we don't even notify medical of that. We handle it and we drive it and we involve law enforcement. So from a CMS perspective, that never kicks in uh, regulatory issues. But as everyone has spoken to so far, when we're involved with a patient, the regulatory guidelines kick in and, uh, and, and Tom said it well, you know, that the patient has rights. Uh, we, we need to um, treat the patient with dignity and respect. Uh, and I would say the same about non-patients too, really. And I would Excellent. add that I would add that um, really, regardless of who we're dealing with, we're 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 entering the situation already, striving to create a non-escalating environment. We're striving to not go hands-on, and if we do go hands-on, we're striving to do it in the the with the least amount of force as possible. Excellent. One thing that I just I have to say after listening to the three of you um, talk about this, this discussion that we're having right now really highlights how how much more Im- important it is to have training for our healthcare security and healthcare police um, versus uh, th- those municipal uh, law enforcement 
um, or even those uh, at campus. And many of us have, have worked in all of those fields. And use of force is use of force is use of force when you're on the street. But in a healthcare environment, it is, it is there's, as you said, Robert, those security-led situations, maybe where there's a fight or something that's, that's taking place outside um, where it's very clear how those officers uh, take action. But mm-hmm. when it's a patient, uh, it's very different. And, and it's very important. Um, I mean, we, as you said, we strive to never have to engage, but there are rules and regulations that apply in, in those various situations. So um, great information. So, Tony, I, I wanted to ask you, do you, you think there is any type of difference, especially since you, you talked about um, the first part of your, your career uh, and how a proprietary, an in-house security officer uh, responds versus a contracted security uh, regarding the use of force situation. You know, Lisa, in a very high level, it should not. Um, you know, I've worked in a third party setting a lot, um, worked for an organization that was owned by hospitals and today working for the Paladin family of companies. And, and I can speak to something today that I used to not be able to with the same clarity of, you know, this is a North American issue, right? I'm seeing security delivered in, in healthcare across Canada in addition to the U.S. nowadays uh, with what I'm doing with Powden. But what's so interesting about this is that, uh, oddly enough, a lot of times as a third-party provider, we're held to an even higher standard um, for the use of force, the training that is expected of us, not typically by the uh, entity itself, the hospital or the healthcare organization, but by the regulatory agencies, the jurisdictions that are governing the licensure of a security officer. Uh, There are some variabilities to that. Um, The state of California um, holds the uh, in-house operators to the same exact standard as those that are providing this for a a fee. Uh, But in saying that, it should not have an impact for how the officers are positively intervening on behalf of the clinical care team or the security interventions that Robert just talked about. Um, I I, I think a lot of times it needs to be very well identified and clarified in the contractual arrangement, whatever that master services agreement is with those entities. Um, I'm sure Tom would attest, uh, there's a lot of times where that's actually a mute issue. And I think that's where um, we've evolved a lot as an industry, but I think for those that aren't, it's something that they really wanna make certain is very well clear. The training standards, the thing I always like to see is a training standard that is multidisciplinary, that we're not just training a security officer to a, to a program that's different than what's happening inside the healthcare organization itself. Because, you know, there are times when those clinical care providers are looking at it and saying that's a, that might be excessive when it is a technique that is a fully appropriate trained technique. They just haven't been exposed to it. And I think what's important here is that the more that that training is working together and in concert, I think the better the patient outcome. I mean, when you start thinking about BERT, um, we start thinking about those responses that we have. What do we really want? We wanted to see a positive patient outcome. There are times when I have clinical care providers who don't want to see patients be applied. And I'm not talking... Um, about the patient. I'm talking about literally having patience for the circumstance to really resolve itself and allowing for someone to express themselves, to de- demonstrate their disruptive selves. It may not be comfortable. None of us really want to see it, but it probably is the right approach for the individual. And I think when we're thinking about the training, well, we want the third party officer, we want the in house officer, we want the clinical care providers to all basically be operating off that same sheet of music because when that happens there's a lot of harmony that occurs when it doesn't now oh, it sounds like me singing in the choir it's not a good sound agreed i think something that's really important that you touched on as far as the contractual uh, agreement is um, i think it's important that uh, everybody knows kind of where their lane is and that it's very that it, that it is specified because i think there is a shared liability and um, and it's important. I, I don't know that it's uh, it's something that everybody, all the the, uh, the contract companies out there, really uh, delve into, and and even some of our healthcare organizations. So thank you. So Lisa, this, I think 
I, yes, I think, on, you know, on that point, uh, I was going to mention it later that, you know, also who's responsible for maintaining the competencies that should be spelled out in the contracts that who and what is, what do they have to be competent in? What, what is their role in? What are the competencies and who's going to do that training uh, and maintain and make sure that they're, they're reaching what, whatever level of competency it is, whether it's a outside training, whether it's uh, in-house training, um, and then who's signing on the dotted line that says they're competent to do this, whatever the procedure is for restraint and seclusion. And would you recommend that the, a clinician be involved with, with that as well? It, yeah, absolutely. If, if it, again, it depends on who's doing the overall training for the organization related to restraint and seclusion. Normally it's, uh, it's someone in, that's either been a clinician or, or currently a clinician in conjunction with whoever the training people are that uh, conduct training for the security operation. And, and Tom, though, wouldn't you say that advice is appropriate regardless of the model being deployed? Absolutely. It, it, it's, I've, the I find model it is both, not the difference. Programs. The Certainly. model is not the difference. It's, it's the leadership of <clears throat> said model, and it's the expectations, which when a third party, you sometimes get a little more formal <laughs> because it's a contractual arrangement. Whereas when you're working as an in-house operator, sometimes you don't have that, but that's what we want to have with our post orders, our SOPs, and the understanding guiding principles that, that would be applied. Oftentimes that could be hospital policy as well. But I think it's important that we, we really try to say the information that we're sharing here today, the model is not the difference maker. It's the application of the principles that is really the difference maker. They, both both models uh, require competencies. It's just yeah. making sure who's doing them and and that they get done on the required within the normally it's an annual requirement for uh, restraint and seclusion. But making sure someone's doing that training. Excellent, I agree. So I will move on to Jill. Um, you've been quiet, but I would like to really kind of grab a little bit of your expertise and see if you would share your thoughts on preventing or mitigating this use of force that we've been talking about on patients. Yeah, absolutely, Lisa. And it's, it's going to be hard to follow uh, that discussion. Uh, so my answer is definitely going to take a, a pretty hard left turn. Um, I think throughout you know, the course of the conversation, they're talking about a very specific moment in time. Uh, it's a moment in time where we've decided someone has made the decision that we have to go hands-on, we have to touch, uh, we have to use force, we have to stabilize the situation. We have to physically stabilize the situation uh, with the goal of uh, reducing you know, potential injury that could occur if, if we didn't do something here and now, right? We wanna intervene earlier in this cycle. Um, so with that, we know we're witnessing assaultive behavior, at-risk behavior, and regardless if that behavior is you know, injurious to self or injurious to others, we have to stop it. And that's the specific moment in time that we're talking about. Uh, but we can't, we can't stop there and just take a picture of that moment. We have to be able to look at that incident as a, as a full length film. You know, uh, I think it was Tom earlier said, you know, it is being recorded. We're, we're in the era of the digital tattoo. We have to be able to rewind the incident and look at uh, what preceded it and what preceded that moment in time. And that's really uh, where I think a lot of organizations fail to train. Uh, you've, you've now entered the realm of non-escalation. Uh, and if you don't train in the realm of non-escalation, then you're starting your training tape too late. Uh, you've missed, um, you know, it's, that's really from a prevention standpoint where I look, uh, where we as a company, as Vistalar looks in terms of training and in terms of conflict management, you know, our ultimate goal is to prevent uh, and reduce workplace injuries and create emotionally and physically safe environments. So what's interesting about that is most people don't know what non-escalation is. Uh, and Robert, you know, talked about this earlier, creating that environment that is non-escalatory, but that's because de-escalation is the buzzword. It is the buzzword since 2015. Uh, de-escalation training was being mandated all over the country across multiple industries by, you know, different regulating bodies. Uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I've yet to see where anyone has offered grant funding or mandated training for non-escalation. So to answer your question, preventing and mitigating, I'm going to say 
Uh, looking at non-escalation is going to include the philosophy, right, of treating all people with dignity by showing respect. Uh, that's been mentioned throughout the whole conversation today. And it also includes uh, a specific set of skills. So it's going to include all of the things that you can say and do uh, from preventing someone from kind of escalating up onto that ledge in the first place versus de-escalation, uh, which is going to be all of the things we can say and do to bring someone you know, off of that ledge or down. Uh, so in the realm of non-escalation, when we, when, we run, when we run training, our focus is really on uh, not just what you say, but how you say it and what you looked like the moment you said it. And, wh- and how I tie that in is I really think that we have to be responsible uh, for the energy we bring into a space. We have to be accountable for who we are in that moment in time, who we bring to the table uh, at that specific moment. Uh, and it's not to say that if I do everything right, that it still couldn't result in the need to use force because it could and it may. Uh, but at least now I'm accountable and I'm, I know that I did everything I could uh, with my communication, both e- expressive and receptive, to not uh, have it go that way. And I think that's where uh, people people fail to look. So uh, that's a very long answer. I think at the end of the day, uh, we're going to say we need to try to create that supportive atmosphere rather than a defensive one. Uh, we can train how to be more empathetic. Uh, use phrases that are non-judgmental and non-accusatory, non-escalatory, uh, practice the tone and the delivery so that in that moment we don't get to that point that that might be that trigger for that person uh, that would result in the need to stabilize. So, And so that's an excellent answer. I think it's, it's important to realize, though, this should, every single person on the care team should have that same philosophy. Um, unfortunately, as I said earlier, sometimes security is called in um, as that last, you know, response kind of come in with the heavy hands. So, um, I mean, I love that. Excellent. Um, yeah, so talk, Lisa, ahead, if, if you would uh, just allow me to, I, I agree with that completely wholeheartedly. Uh, at the end of the day, I would, you know, way rather take the extra 30 seconds to a minute in an interaction. That extra 30 seconds or a minute needed to be, you know, trauma responsive to come forward with empathy to establish a rapport, listen, be persuasive, uh, rather than taking the extra three hours needed to write a use of force report, Mm -hmm. maybe the extra three days worth of having to explain what happened to supervisors, administrators, even if it was justified, uh, or the extra three years that this incident could potentially go to litigation. I mean, it's just an analogy, but I always believe that if if we're responsible for the energy we bring to a space, uh, we can help keep everybody safer, both emotionally and physically. Such a great point, Jill. And and sometimes just taking a few seconds just to huddle with the care team, right? Let's put our plan together. Let's all understand what we're getting ready to do, what we need to achieve, and can can make such a huge difference. I, I, I appreciate what you just said uh, and hope that uh, there are a lot of clinical care leaders that and, and professionals that would hear that message because I think that's sometimes lost in their scope of work and, and what they believe is their duties and how to work together and how to utilize the resource that is the security officers themselves. Agreed. So Tom, um, a question you mentioned earlier uh, that we would come back to this and with your significant experience um, in various cases concerning healthcare security and use of force, would you be able to share with us any lessons that you've learned from some of the litigation summaries? Sure. You know, I call them, I've been scarred by a few of these cases where um, when you're looking at it as a third party, and again, having sat in the chair of the hospital security directors and police uh, directors for years, looking at it as a third party and, and really digging into people's policies and proceed, department policies, procedures, what training did they do? Who did the training? What did the trainers say? Reading their depositions, um, it can be very painful. And in and, uh, and the end of that, doing all that, I have to give an opinion whether, um, uh, you know, what, what the facts come out. So use of force and patient restraints is a, is a typical um, case. Um, and I don't do hundreds, hundreds of these things. There's probably five or six a year that, that come out. But there are two kinds of cases that I've had more recently, and it's use of force, patient restraint, and uh, patient elopement. So 
use of force patient restraint, I sort of talked about it already. Let's make sure, number one, um, I'll, I'll use this particular organization. They had a pretty good size hospital with a large inpatient mental health unit and a very active emergency department, um, a security department that was pretty well trained. But when we look at what happened, a patient was injured during a, a, a restraint, a very serious injury. And when you unpeel the onion of who did what, um, they had uh, uh, trainers providing training that had never worked in a hospital. They had uh, a law enforcement training, kind of a model that was trained. And then they had the, the patient restraint, the, the techniques for patient restraint that was training. There are several training programs out there. I'm not gonna go into the types, but they had an outside training program model that they were using and there was no connection uh, in their policy and procedure. And um, when being deposed, one of the trainers said, well, um, when, when can you use these law enforcement techniques? And she said, well, anytime the person disregards our verbal directive. And you know, you, you know that's, that doesn't fly in, in the healthcare setting. Um, and that person had never worked in a hospital. So it's, it's, uh, you have to look at those individual cases um, this particular case had this, they had lots of resources, but they weren't coordinated in it. They didn't have a behavioral health response team. Um, this happened to be against an, it's an area of risk where a mental health patient lands on a, a non-mental health floor. And those staff members are often, uh, um, concerned and afraid of the patient. And so, and oftentimes they don't have the, have any tra zero training. And that's the case with this, this organization, the, the charge nurse, the nurse manager, the the nurse for the unit, the floor nurse, and the person that was watching the mental health patient um, didn't have any training in de-escalation, in recognizing, uh, escalating what to do. Um, the nurses on the floor didn't have any training. They didn't have a behavioral health response team member that could come visit with them when they when they got this patient. I always advocate that your your BERT team come around and. If you got one of these patients in a non-behavioral floor, go in there and let them know here are the here's here's where you are. Here's what we can help you with. Here's how to help manage the patient. Um, so that's you have to tie that together with the policies and procedures. I always ask for what are the administrative policies relating to restraint? What are the clinical policies? And then what is the security policy? And do you think that they ever line up? Um, Probably not. There, there's a lot of room for real problems. They were written in different eras by different mm -hmm. people. And so I strongly suggest because th those kind of things were, you know, one or two things sometimes will, you know, you can overcome those in the court setting, but those will sink your, your case. Uh, if you have one, two or three of those all together, it doesn't look like you know what you're doing. And, and whether the injuries were preventable or not, if all of those things were in place, it's hard to say but they're much more likely to not happen if we have those those things in place real quickly about patient elopement i know we're running short on time is is um uh, the definition of elopement but I, i've had some hospitals will say uh hey, you go in there and ask them how many elopements did you have last year and they'll click into their uh incident system well we had 55 elopements from the emergency department and we had you know 64 for the rest of the hospital and i'm going are you serious in elopement? And uh, uh, it's really, if you look at the def, I said, well, what's your definition of elopement? And well, it's an AMA or, you know, those other, there's a lot of other things that they do. But so be very careful with how you're defining what an elopement is, because when you record that, your, uh, if you record things as an elopement, the regulator, the CMS, if you have an adverse event that they come in uh, and, uh, and want to investigate, if you tell them you've got 150 elopements in the last year, um, then they start looking at each and every one and you're doing, you're explaining from a position of weakness. So I even, even my definition of elopement is, well, if they get off the floor and you're following them up to the exit and if you follow them across town and they're still in sight and you bring them back safely, that was an elopement attempt. The system worked. That's, that's just my own personal approach, uh, because I've been scarred by regulators coming in and, and talking about, mm -hmm. uh, you know, being fairly, of course, all the regulators are reasonable, right? Um, fairly unreasonable in these cases. So make sure your policies, make sure you have one, make sure people have, have training. 
um, make sure that uh, the nursing leadership, clinical leadership knows what, what the policy is on elopement. Have a, some places have an overhead page just like uh, an infant abduction. Instead of infant abduction, you know, they've got a code or code walker or patient elopement, and then they'll, they'll give the patient's description. Um, so that's the bottom line. Long story short, for me, align your policies, take a hard look at the training, use a BERT approach if, if you possibly can, um, and then look at these operational guidelines that we talked about there. I, I have a list here that I'll send you, Lisa, but they're just these two topics. There, it looks like there's about 15 operational guidelines that uh, the IHSS has produced that have something to, you know, add to and, and are good, good guidance as people are developing policies and procedures and training. Awesome. And Tom, to your point, um, responding to an elopement is a whole nother um, discussion on use of force and, and the legalities it's, that, that kind of... It's related. It it's certainly definitely, is related. but it is, I mean, it's definitely related, but we could have a whole nother podcast just talking about that, but that is absolutely very appropriate. To that point, a lot of places will say, well, how far should we leave? How far should we chase somebody that's eloped? I say, well, I really don't care, but have a policy on it and follow your policy because some places will say, I've had legal, I've had our, our hospital's attorneys say, Tom, if you can safely follow them, you know, over to the next town and bring it back safely, we want that. I've had other people say, you step one foot off the property mm -hmm. and, um, you're, you're, we don't want that. Well, I had a case that involved a patient who eloped, ran just across the street, climbed up the cell tower and jumped off the cell tower and killed themselves. Well, it didn't look very good that the, the security team ran out to the property line and stopped. No, there's an argument that you can make, okay, if we go across, leave the property and something happens back on the property, then we're responsible. But I don't care as a consultant and an expert witness, have a policy and make sure you, you abide by the policy. Excellent. Uh, this has been an amazing amount of information, great discussion. And I just want to give everybody one more chance. Is there anything else that you want to leave our listeners with? Anyone? Lisa, let me, let me add something that um, actually um, Tony made me think of it. And then Tom fleshed it out a little bit more, but you know, when we, when, when we have our medical team members and our security team members need to be training the same way together, ideally when we, when, when you have, team members who are not trained, who are mistrained, poorly trained, or who are trained in a different system than say what the other department is using, then we have worse patient outcomes, we have more regulatory challenges, and we have more opportunities for injuries to the patient and to the staff. So that's something that is kind of a kind of a, a, an issue to always be on the lookout for because it seems to be always present. Um, but training in one single program together as a BERT team to me is, is, has great, great value to help a health system uh, meet the regulatory guidelines, keep staff safe and happy and have the best patient outcomes. Agreed. Yeah, I would add, uh, Lisa, just in uh, the role and responsibilities of how we keep these organizations safe is evolving. Um, and it's never shown its more central nature than it is today. And I think that's going to continue. But I also believe that we have a role, especially those of us that are in the practitioner's space for security and protection, is how are we educating others, bringing attention to what right looks like. The guidelines, I think, are, are really set up as the best practice. And we've heard that threaded throughout a lot of our conversations today. I, I think it's important that we continue to have the conversations because I feel like our nursing staff members are probably more scared today than if I've ever seen them in my 30 years of being in this space. And I think what we want to try to do is make certain that we are doing what we need to do to help keep them safe while balancing the importance of patient safety. Those interventions, I think oftentimes we're getting involved late as, as part of security. But when you really start unpacking it, what did we find? That the nursing staff member didn't have any education. And our education of nursing and doctors, et cetera, if you look at their formal education, it's not happening. We're not teaching 
non-escalation, de-escalation, aggression management inside of nursing schools. It's interesting to talk to the nursing school administrators who are saying, we don't want to because we're afraid we're going to lose people from joining the profession. Our doctors aren't getting this training as well. And I think that's where the onus is upon the healthcare organization and those of us are protecting them to make certain we understand that that's the challenge that we're facing. So I think this is a multifaceted issue. Use of force is something that will happen uh, no matter how much we try to keep it from occurring. We have intentional and we have unintentional violence that is happening inside of our healthcare delivery system every day. I can uh, only imagine the events that have happened since we started this conversation just here in the last hour. But it's important that we take it. And I think we've got to continue to really be focused in on how do we do everything we can to prevent and then when we need to respond, how do we do that with the least amount of force necessary, but it's reasonable, it's appropriate. And to Tom's perspective, as he's, I've heard him say many a time over my career, it's also defensible. So thanks. Excellent. Excellent. This has been amazing. I want to thank you, number one, for your wisdom, sharing all of your wisdom and your experiences with um, not only each other, but also our listeners, and um, I hope that I get this group back again soon. So thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa.